recording. Okay, so um, the first item today is just sort of the update on the implementation of risk metrics in Augur. And this is uh, probably all of yours first look at the new Augur front end, which is running on my machine right now. I haven't fully deployed it anywhere yet, but I will today. Um, you can see the total number of current forks. There's some activity metrics, which we've talked about as being interesting from a risk assessment activity perspective. And then I think the most interesting, useful novel information that's now available are is the set of licenses declared in a project. So the project we're looking at is Apache's Ant project, which is a major project for um, um, I'm on the phone. I'll, be, I'll come get you when I'm done. So that's recorded. Uh, <laughs> recorded. Yeah. Uh, so the license is declared is the first of the risk metrics that, that we have. And I suppose the, the first question um, might be, uh, I suppose, Matt, maybe there's, you could tell us what other detail might be available underneath. So it says that it found, for example, some of these LGPL and unclassified licenses in the package. And I assume it found those in different files. Yeah, um, I think Matt could correct me on this one, but it's, I think it's in license declarations only that it does the declared. Um, yeah, but it would, it would be found in the separate files most likely, Sean. So okay. Some sort of some sort of marker, some sort of text in the file that Nomos has pulled out and determined this is probably an MIT license, or this is based on the text, or this is an right. So like a regular expression. Yeah, basically. Yep. Okay. So there doesn't have to be an explicit declaration that this is an LGPL license, but Nomos hmm. just does text matching. I like that. Yep. Is that is that for the licenses declared that it does that? It's license declared. License concluded requires human. Okay. Yep. Okay. So you would it would be you then that says, "Yep, I agree that that's LGPL," and then that would be a concluded license. I see. So is there um, how do how do people track that ordinarily? Do they then do they commit something to a file that says that, that or yeah the the bill of materials the SPDX document can track. Okay. That. Yep. So there's two different. Um, whatever, two different rows. One is licenses declared and one is licenses concluded. Do, do we want to show people licenses concluded for those projects that have done that? Or? It'll, it'll, it almost never exists. I oh, okay. Never, ever, ever, ever see it. The only, <laughs> the only argument I think for licenses concluded is if you ran two scanners across it and uh -huh. both came up with whatever, MIT for the same light or for the same file. I see. And then you'd have at least some confidence that if two yeah, speakers found the exact same thing, maybe we should just go ahead and conclude that. Yeah. I mean, that would be something that we would kind of have to decide. I think this would be the working group to sort of choose. And I suppose Kate is probably the... Yeah, she might be the person to ask on that. We've tried this before in DoSox. It ended up creating more overhead than than people wanted, but that was a while ago too. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if, if there, if Matt, I mean, Matt Snell, are there other scanners that are easily plugged into, like, I don't know what easily means, but if DoSox could run a different scanner and produce that data, then getting the data from two scanners is then something we have infrastructure to display if we wanted to decide that. Whereas in the past, I don't think you had a way to sort of automatically reconcile all that. Phosology, Phosology at the highest level provides multiple scanners. So Monk is another one, M-O-N-K. All right. And uh, I actually think in the latest release of Phosology is um, Daniel German's Ninka scanner. Okay. Um, and then there's another, there's actually a, another scanner that I like quite a bit. It's um, scan code, which is not part of Phosology, but it's the next B tool. It's just super easy to deploy, and it does a nice job as well. Are there in the uh, in the Augur example here? What's the 
what's the difference between the ones that are found by nomos and the ones that are just have empty notes yeah i wondered that too how are they found um, i don't know matt do you have any insight on how a license declaration i would is is there a way, a way that it's so it's, if it's just regular expression how else would it be found i think the only difference that I've ever seen that actually has anything to do with the file monomus or not is uh, if it's declared in like the, the header of the doc of the file that's all I can the, the only difference I really noticed but I don't know if that's actually a like correlation causation kind of thing so there is a possibility that you can use the SPDX short identifiers you know I mean just like hashtag w3c at the top it's like a meta yeah. meta thing at the top of every document. I don't know, I don't, Augur may or may not do this. Just a certain, certainly we, I mean, I think, Matt, if you could look into where, the, so this is the Apache Ant project that we're looking at right now. If, if you could look into what it means when there's a short name for the license declared and it doesn't um, say found by Nomos, yeah, that needs to be in here because like you it's entirely a Dusox thing and I don't I wouldn't know where to start looking for that. And I actually don't know the answer to that one off the top of my head. So, so like how did you find Apache? Basically the question is how did you find Apache two O? <laughs> Why is that in the list? <laughs> if it's yeah. not declared by Nomos. And I don't have an answer to that off the top of my head because I don't know how Dusox scanning works well that's for you matt got it also about the nomos scanner thing it looks like nomos is like integrated it's the only scanner for do socks right now because like true. in the config you're finding like scanner nomos path and stuff like that so we need to actually integrate a new scanner or, or a system that will um, use multiple scanners in a certain way that's correct when we did do socks, we stripped out all the other scanners. Jane, could you come back when I'm done, please? They weren't as good. I'll come upstairs, okay? Sorry. Also recorded. I know. So, uh, <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> Not much. Okay. Uh, this is nice, though. Looks good. The UI looks good, by the way. No, oh, thanks. Yeah, this is uh, probably everyone's first look at it. It's actually one of my first looks at something that's useful in it. So there's a lot of uh, work happening on this part right now. When it comes to f Fossology, I know we're using DSOX and we're familiar with it. Um, is it, I guess as a, as a question, like in terms of scanning, um, is what is the trade-off for the sort of the decision process? Fossology acts as a standalone app that assembles these different scanners is is the aim then of using DUSOX to provide similar information with a, a separate subset of scanners or just in terms of positioning the risk metrics that we're providing with this kind of scanning I'm I'm curious Matt uh, and Jessica what I mean and Matt you you know I'm just curious what both of you think in terms of the utility and of adding additional scanners to do socks and what the trade-off with Fossology is? I will, so I'm not as familiar with all of the scanners as you all are. In fact, like, I don't know what is covered by one scanner and not covered by another. I think for me, the big focus is on for the um, risk metrics that we agreed to target for like the first release or whatever. Um, whatever scanners we need to make sure that we have those metrics available in um, through the auger site or through whatever you know however we're expecting people to get to them. Yep, um, Jessica, for you, like Nomos can capture quite a bit. We found it to be kind of the best scanner, at least back in the day when we were first doing this with Dusox. Um, but it it certainly does miss cases that other scanners can pick up. So the fidelity of the data will improve with additional scanners. So I, the question for you is, you know, like Nomos obviously provides more than nothing. Um, 
how how much do you wanna? You know, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, no, it does. I, well, the way that the way that I'm looking at this is um, almost like a return on investment type thing. Obviously, I'm not the one having to figure out how to use all these scanners and integrate it into the back end um, service. And so, for me, um, if it, if there's scanners that are provided that can provide useful information, but they're a pain in the ass to configure. Um, you know, maybe it's it's not as worth it. I guess the question is, and maybe y'all can just help me understand this from the get-go, from the um, the metrics that we did agree on, I think we picked out, what was it, something like 10? Five or six. Oh, it was, okay, so it was, it was even less than that. Um, but there's, I think there's 10 them? that are reasonably well-developed. I just put the link in the chat, if you have that in front of you. Yeah. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. So yeah, it's seven. Okay. Um, I mean, do we have those seven available? I all all the licensed ones are available. Um, committers, we have uh, the data. Elephant Factor, we we have the data. So it's just implementing the APIs. We did the licensed ones first because, frankly, they were the easiest APIs to write. Sure. Um, Elephant Factor and committers will be pretty straightforward as well bill of materials. Although I have some questions about like, uh, essentially, I think the bill of materials will provide probably something like this. Um, that would be the idea, yep. When we end up doing it. And although that's the direct text output, but the bill of materials metric, like when we hit that, that's gonna be a massive um, thing. But isn't the question, does the project- Massive in amount of work to get it- uh, no, 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 I'm not, no, the work is pretty straightforward, but like when you give someone that data, it's just like, here's a list of all the software that's included in this package, and it's probably hundreds or thousands of items, depending on- But isn't the what, question, isn't the question, does the project have a bill of materials, not we will produce a bill of materials for you? No, well, I had it in my mind that we would be generating the bill of materials from DUSOX. Perhaps I Honestly, if you can generate the bill of materials, I'm not going to tell you not to because that's something that we can. That's actually the Linux Foundation could have. Like, that, yeah, that's that's nice. That's real nice. <laughs> am, I, am I smoking crack to think we can do that, Matt? Matt, well, Usox does that. That's, that's what, what I thought. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Primary output of Usox. So yes, that can be done, Jessica. Okay, because I mean, the way that we're looking at this right now, um, I probably said this ad nauseum, but you know, essentially, if, if we can have people who are identifying um, software packages that they're going to use in their own internal products for whatever reason, um, I mean, at, at that point, you know, they should be keeping track of their own software build materials as they build it, but it sounds like this could also be used to um, develop a very comprehensive dependency tree. It'll mm -hmm. develop a very comprehensive bill of materials, yeah, for that project. So it'll basically list, it basically produces an SPDX document. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Because I mean, I, I think, you know, there's there's been an open question for um, the LF where we are putting a lot of focus on people having a software bill of materials just because the, I mean, if you don't know what you're using, then you really can't do much analysis on it. Um, so for a lot of the things that we're looking at, including the CI badge, um, the chaos metrics themselves, you know, you, the, the basic idea is that people would come with, um, with a fully fleshed out software bill of materials, but that, uh, for one thing, that's not an easy question for a lot of organizations still. Um, they're either stuck with commercial tools that are very expensive or they just don't have access to anything. And so if this works and this is, um, and I guess the, the next question I would have is like, what how complicated is it for somebody not associated with the project to be able to use Augur or the Chaos Matrix or something to produce um, produce the SPDX file on demand, the DUSOX file on demand? It wouldn't. It, um, in theory, it's, it shouldn't be that hard. I mean, the the reason we made DUSOX is so that we could produce these bill of materials on nightly builds at companies. So Phosology is a web interface, right? And so, like using it in a production environment is doesn't make a whole ton of sense just because you're not going to ask people to go to a web interface 
when you're doing nightly builds. So Deuce right. was built so that it could be part of an automated build system. And it's those SPDX documents that are really what were intended to capture the data from that nightly build. Because then sure. to your point, Jessica, we can't, those are way easier to scan <laughs> and do something yeah. because they're, they're finalized documents. So. And when you say scan right. that, you mean for a human to scan through them? Or even just to write a piece of software to go across them. They're just, cause they're in the, they're in a tag format. And so you can, just, right. they're just so much easier to write at, write queries at. So, so Matt Snell, correct me if I'm wrong, but all of the things that are included in the software bill of materials that uh, DoSox outputs also exist as discrete lines in the database that we have, right? Um, yeah, we can pull them out using DoSox. Um, so the, no, yeah. sir, go ahead. Uh, so I guess are we are we capturing that? Is the there's two questions. One is the software bill of materials information in the database. Yes. For, for the scans we made, Matt, did we run that part of DUSOX? Yeah, the DUSOX covered everything that's in the document, the tag value document that you can output. Okay, so the, the question is, one thing the database could do is, um, if the scan is different, then DUSOX enters a new record. And so we could produce a sort of a change record over time on multiple DUSOX scans with the database data. One question I have is, is it sensible to also produce the, to share through Augur a link or some form of this actual, I think it's a text file that is the, the bill of materials that is printed out in the example. Is that right, Matt Snell, that this is a text file? Yeah, that's from an actual DoSox scan output. Right. Or a generation output. And it's a, it's a, it's a scan. Yeah. I mean, it's, a text yeah. file. it's just yeah. like straight up text. Yeah, you can put it in tag or RDF. So I also have, have a JSON version of this as well. It's something that puts a JSON out when it um, generates it. So, I mean, the real, I mean, I guess the question I'm asking is what is the, when we get to the software bill of materials metric, what is the most helpful way to output it and present it in Augur? Well, I mean, I think and this again, I, I may be misunderstanding this. I, I think when we had originally conceptualized the software bill of materials metric, it was going to be a yes, no. Does this software provide its own bill of materials? That's what I thought. Um, okay. But if it's, I, I mean, if, if, it, if a software bill of materials can be created using this tool, then one, I think you can still have, um, and so have the software bill of, bill of materials metric be like a yes or no question as in, you know, does this, or, did this organization or did whoever came up with this piece of software um, compile their own software bill of materials? And, and if so, here's where you find it or something. But um, I, I think if you can generate it, then the question of whether or not one exists becomes less of a priority because then, you can just, if the answer is no, you can just make it or you can just make it anyway and then compare the two or something like that. But um, I didn't, I mean, I'm just, I'm actually really like, I'm really excited <laughs> that um, this is available because I didn't, this, this answers a, a problem that I've been having um, separate and apart from the chaos metrics, which is how we get people to be able to create software and materials without having to shell out a bunch of money or, or spend a bunch of time on it. Create them with Phasology too. Yeah, I just I if this so well actually let me let me maybe do it this way. So say I am a medical device company because I've got to play the character, um, and I want to check out a couple of open source software packages that I'm I might want to use in my project. Are we to the point with um, at least the seven metrics of we've identified where um, maybe not right at this moment, but when the, the website goes live or, or after chaos con, where if I come to the Augur website with my list of, let's say four open source software packages that I want to get metrics on, can I essentially feed package one to Augur and have it populate the metrics? Are we not there yet? You have to, I mean, if you have packages that, you, so I think you're asking, do we have something for you to say here are, here's a repo that I want to scan and generate data from? Yes. 
right now we need to put that repo in for you. Uh, okay. So I haven't, everything has been scanning, scanned at this point from repo lists that people provide. It's, it's not out of the question that I would, I would say it's, it's certainly on our path to allow people to, to put in a repo URL and do all of the work of generating all of the Augur statistics. The, the trick there is that people kind of have to host their own version of Augur because that kind of exposes our hosting environment to a, an unbounded right. <laughs> set of possible load. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, but the capability exists. Yes. I'm, okay. Like if somebody, if you sent me a list of repos that you wanted these statistics, the, the all the license stuff on, we can do that today. If, if, um, and by sometime shortly after chaos, I expect that we'll be able to produce chaos con. I expect we'll be able to produce all of them. Uh, I have no, I mean, there was nothing on here that the only one that is going to require a little dancing is test coverage. So we're just going to have to make a decision about which languages we want to attack first because test coverage is, it's uh, those kinds of tools are different by light, by a computing language. So okay, th there's not a toolkit that does the whole universe. Um, okay. That's the only thing that we haven't done yet of all the things on here. And of these seven, the, not and not the full yeah. list. Okay. Yeah, and there are things on the full list that we've done as well. So okay. there, are, there are risk metrics that can become, you know, will become part of Augur um, going forward. So okay. Two, one, two things. One is I think Sean was also saying like if somebody deploys Augur locally, then they can plug in the repos so they're to the heart's content. Is that right, Sean? Yep. That's right. You just go to town. So if yeah, I think what we're trying to figure out, because um, I, I think the, the Linux Foundation goal with at least the things that I've been working on is to make this as simplified as possible. And so like I wouldn't know how to deploy a local Augur instance. Like probably it's not that complicated and I could probably figure it out, but I think what we are trying to get to- No, is, it's pretty complicated. I'm not okay. gonna, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it's, it's, um, you need a technology person. There's a lot of technology that is needed and, and it's connected. And if, Do um, you have any idea, um, probably not, but I'll ask anyway, like how much, um, I don't even know how to properly quantify it. I'll just call it resources. It takes to scan a single repository. Not a ton. I mean, it, it takes mostly, I mean, the biggest, the longest poll in the tent is actually time. I think okay. we about 2,200 repositories in this sample database. And if, Matt, I think it took, what, like four or five days to scan everything? That's about right, yeah. Okay. Well, because I'm thinking, so a, a couple of things, and this is all going to come together, hopefully. Um, I don't know how much we've talked about the Census 2 project, but this is where the Linux Foundation is working with Harvard to identify the world's most used open source based on data that we're gathering from a whole variety of sources. Okay. Um, and we've started identifying like the top 100, 200 open source packages that um, we have been able to pull out. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about recently on that is we would like to be able to have some kind of way to make essentially value judgments on how healthy that open source software is. Well, that's the chaos project. Right. Um, and from my perspective, that's risk. And so for, for example, at one point, like I, I think the Linux foundation is probably going to want to um, take the, the census two results and then essentially plug them into Augur so that we would have all of those repos that all of the, the metrics available for each of those packages um, already like ready to go. So that's yeah. one thing. Um, it's, that's I'm, easy. If you have those, if you have those repositories, um, we can just do that. Um, what we don't, yeah. I think the piece that you're like, so one of the things that the chaos project has been clear about is not deciding for people, what is a healthy or a not healthy project. 
and Augur has the is is taking a, a stance that we're implementing the agnostic chaos metrics, but we want to we will provide tools that let you put parameters in that help you to draw general judgments about those one to two hundred projects about which are more more or less healthy, and and those judgments. I think I haven't seen that list of projects, but in other lists of projects I've had, the, the projects fall into groups. And so one of the things that we're going to provide here this fall is a way of saying similarity between different projects in terms of the number of committers, the number of issues, different statistics that make the project similar statistically. And then yeah. looking at the relative you know, measurement on things like commits, committers, elephant factor uh, within that set. I think, and I think that's how you, you're probably going to have to try to draw conclusions about health level. Cause I, you know, for a lot of, a lot of projects are just different than, you know, so different than each other. That, I will say if, if the Linux foundation, if the Linux foundation wants to ascribe value on the metrics, I'm okay with that. But yeah. Yeah. I think for, and we can present that. Like if you say, here are the parameters for our health, you can, we can make it so that you can provide those parameters across all 200 projects. Yeah. But then we don't judge. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think for right now, like we, um, there's a steering committee associated with the census two projects that I think would probably be the ones sort of coming up with the parameters, um, for project health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my, concern or, or the thing that I'm focused on right now is just having the the metrics available um, so just if I you know if if I want to go look at four projects or something the question for me is you know are do they already exist in some kind of data pool or do they already exist on some server somewhere um, and the answer is that, the answer is becoming yes on that yeah, yeah. It is. And so I, I think the way that I'm looking at this is that, you know, if we, if the Linux Foundation through the Census 2 projects ends up, let's call it sponsoring, it's not the right term, but I, I think it sort of gets at what I'm getting at. If we sponsor the chaos project, applying the metrics to these, these 100, 200 projects that we identify, that's going to be a pretty robust set, especially because, you know, we're, we are, that's based on a large data pool about what is the world's most used open source. Um, but the, the question for me then becomes w with the way that we're envisioning some of the security tooling that we're looking at working, we mm. do need to have a capability or we are going to want a capability where people can come to the project with a list and somehow with the minimum amount of effort possible, be able to feed repositories to it and get back the metrics. And so I think that's, that, that's sort of what I'm trying to figure out how to get to that. Not well, even getting to the like what, putting any value judgments around the project help itself, but just getting the metrics available in the first place. How does, um, who does the hosting services for CII? That's a great question. I have but, no idea. Okay. But it's something like that, I think is what you're getting at. Like actually yeah. providing hosting services where some external person who we don't know who they are or community can participate with the project unbeknown, you know, kind of in that out in the open. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would ask if there's any possibility for hosting services at the Linux Foundation. Yeah, because then we could work with you to have an instance of Augur yeah. on it. Exactly what you're talking about. And we yeah. also have, you can see in the upper right, we do have a login capability um, on our roadmap as well so that people can put something on the public web without having to worry about GDPR and other kinds of things. Oh, and I, right. well, that's good. And I think from a long-term sustainability project of being able to provide that service, if a group like the LF makes a ton more sense than a university. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I know um, we've already started talking about that just because it's right. It, makes sense and it's going to be a necessity of making sure that these remain available and um yeah, so we're, we're, yeah. But, well, i was going to say we're, we're grant driven so our yeah. money is all soft money it's just different money and so yeah no but i mean i i think you know we we already um started using like the open ssl one even just beyond the idea of being like here's an example of what the the 
chaos metrics can provide. Like the OpenSSL one ended up at answering um, a question that our CEO had on like, <laughs> who's been working on OpenSSL recently, we're like, oh, well, like, well, we just happen to have this information available and we're able to tell him just based on that. So, you know, I think there's value to the Linux Foundation outside of even just um, the project in and of itself. So I, don't, I, I think that that's a conversation that we're very uh, willing to have. I think it's just for us, we need to figure out what exactly that's gonna mean and, and how exactly that would work. Okay, well, yeah, I, think, I think David Wheeler actually, you know, and D David Wheeler talks very effectively. Um, but he did mention if we wanted to host an Augur instance that he could possibly throw some hardware at it. And mm. I, ha I haven't pursued that because we haven't had a need to, but if, if this kind of Linux foundation oriented infrastructure is something you're looking at, David may in fact, if you may be able to ask him and he may be able to say, yeah, because it doesn't take a, it doesn't take, you know, it's not a, giant resource hog it's not resource free the biggest the biggest cost server wise is when you're generating all the data mm -hmm. you know serving up but the, that sounds like, that's a pretty one-time cost I was, unless you want to go back and, and if the well, it's not, basically well, by keeping the projects updated from any time from daily overnight or weekly overnight you're going to go get the new polls from each repository and calculate the statistics again so there's a this kind of a cyclical, depending how often, you know, you do it, the more often you do it, the lower the load is when you do do it. Um, but I suspect we all have hardware that sits twiddling its thumbs at night. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's doable. I think it, it, I don't think it's going to be an, an impossible lift or even necessarily a hugely difficult lift to figure out how to, um, how to host something like that, just because, like I said, like, I, I think the value has been made pretty clear to me, to my boss. Um, so that that's not the problem. I, I think, again, it just comes down to this question of um, like exactly how that would work. Like, you know, is it, are you going to, does it make sense that, you know, we would have some kind of ls.auger site that people could go to and, and then are, are we going to have it so that people can come to us with a repository and plug it in or is it something where you know they fill in a request form i don't i don't know but i, I think from the, on the back end side like i don't i don't know that it's going to make sense for for you or for us that we need to come to you every time we have a repository that we want scanned i think it um there might need to be some kind of plug and play capability that that we can control or somebody can control where, you know, if we do want to scan a new repository, I don't have to email you or email Matt or somebody, you know, I can just, I can point the tool at that repository. Yeah. I think, I think what, what we probably, I mean, that's, those are things that are, are on our roadmap. I think when it comes to actually putting this live in a production environment, I want to make sure that we have a person who understands what's happening and, and can just sort of administer it. Right. So, mm -hmm and then provide feedback. Uh, you know, we've gotten a couple of folks using it pretty heavily and we're getting pretty regular feedback and making adjustments uh, based on that. But uh, I think, you know, it's like, a, it's like any software service. Um, we haven't packaged it yet. And I, th I think, you know, that would be maybe somewhere where if you have someone at the Linux Foundation who has expertise in packaging something for distribution to a server, which would put it in the ordinary file directory structures that people expect things to be in. Then I, then I think it's probably easier for infrastructure folks to, to manage. Certainly developers can install it and run it. But I think what you're talking about is actually making it a piece of infrastructure. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, that's some, that's something to do. We just haven't, we haven't done it and right now I don't think we have the resources to make that part of like hardening it for infrastructure happen. But we yeah. can make it available and, and help you work with it so that, that it is functional and useful for the purpose you described. Yeah, well, I think just, for now, um, just something to keep in mind, like I think that's gonna be our end goal is something like that. Um, I don't know exactly how it would relate to Community Bridge, but it, you know, I, I think we, we certainly have with the Community Bridge platform folks who are very good at deploying infrastructure in the way that you're describing. And so probably that's- I expect the Linux Foundation would. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, and so I, I think we can we can certainly manage that. It's just going to be a um, question of is, one: it, is it possible? It sounds like the answer is yes. Um, yes. We're just not quite to that point yet, which is fine. Right. Um, and so I, I think you know I, I do know pretty much for a guarantee that at some point we are going to want to take the census to package list that we come up with and run that through auger and then where that where that the results of that sit um you know that's not decided yet but i assume somewhere at the lf um and then just on a on a more ongoing basis so that people can use this as a um service no. <laughs> auger as a service type thing right. um you know i i think that is going to be something that that we're going to want to explore well, we're, yeah. we, I mean, I think we're, we built it for that kind of thing. So Perfect. we're ready to talk about figuring out how to do that. Hey, I had one thing. Um, that sounds really cool. I'm going to put this link in here. Can you see that, Jessica? Um, yeah, it's, oh, there we go. Okay. I just want to, you had mentioned that you're excited that we can produce these bill of materials on SPDX with two socks. This mm -hmm. This part right here, are you familiar with the SPDX spec? I mean, I, I, I know about it. I, you couldn't quiz me on like the, the individual components of it. All right, well then, then <laughs> just, just how about this? To, suffice it to say that the SPDX spec is super duper long and complicated. Okay. Like, a lot of like detail in it. And what you're looking at here is relationships between elements that within an SPDX document, it gets really, really detailed. So it's great information, but DUSOX can't do like this kind of stuff yet. Okay. Just F it's more of an FYI. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's fine. And actually this is, um, I don't know, I'm sure it's, it's come up in conversation to what extent y'all are aware of the um, separate bill of materials, multi-stakeholder process that's happening at the NTIA. Oh, um, okay. okay. Essentially, it's just the United States government, meaning me back when I worked with Congress, <laughs> uh, um, got really tired of everyone talking about how impossible it was to deploy software bill of materials, and we essentially told them to suck it up and go figure it out. And so um, the NTIA process is them figuring it out. Okay. And um, th that's ongoing, but I, I think the, the bottom line that's coming out of that is people are trying not to let perfect be the enemy of the good, and they're just looking for can we produce something that gives us even the basic information okay. that we need? Like it yeah. does this software package exist in this piece of software. And DUSAX does that. Yeah. And so, and I, and I think that's what I mean when I say like, I, I'm not bothered by the fact oh, that yeah. um, it doesn't produce a full SPDX. I, I, I think the fact that it gets even. That I wasn't overselling it. That I'm like, oh yeah. yeah. yeah no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we can get to the moon. We yes, just so. need a, Eight billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like, do I do I think probably like Kate will be interested to see, you know, can can it be iterated on to the point that it does resemble more of the SPDX spec? Probably, um, but for the time being, yeah. okay. We certainly resemble the spec. We just have a lot of white space. Yeah, we, we can't answer things so. Yeah, which is, I, I get, and like, I just, I, I think even providing, let's call it the basic, like, building blocks of the, of the spec, I, I think is, it even gets a lot of companies who, um, I, let, let me put it this way, my experience with a lot of companies, especially companies who aren't software companies by trade, like, they, they, they still think of themselves as manufacturing physical products, even though what they really do is stick software in physical products, um, they don't want to have to think about you know, oh, do I want to use SPDX or do I want to use some other format? They just want to be like, I want to generate an SBOM. Where is the button that I press to generate an SBOM? Yep. And it seems like this gets them much closer to that oh, yeah. than a lot of the other tools that I've seen, which is, I think, the difference between... Okay. Yeah. It, does, it definitely does that. Okay. Cool. And, and that's why I'm like, yes, this is fantastic. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> That was it for me. That was just my one comment. So. Yeah. Yeah. No. Don't worry. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hold you to the world's greatest S bomb. 
And then I, I guess I have another question on the census two stuff. Are you, are you on that project or you just, do you know about I'm it? leading it. Yeah. It's, oh, it's kind of my, okay. yeah. So I'll make you on it. Yeah. <laughs> are you, um, are you following the old census model? The, like the 2016 stuff that came out of the CII census or. Yeah. Guess, it's, it's the next iteration of that. Have you modified how you're um, identifying projects that should be in the, that list because you know, like the old census web pages has like if you if you have this this and that you get a point or something like that yeah that was um that was david wheeler's method yeah. um we so the people who are doing it the harvard yeah researchers they have a methodology i don't know that i could tell you what it is can you off the top of my head <laughs> could you ask if we could see it even if it's in confidence, it just, and if they say no, that's totally fine. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious as to what they're using to identify those projects really from a chaos perspective. Yeah. Well, um, what I'll do, we have, um, actually this is going to sound super strange. If we're, if the, let's say it's a, if the risk part of the call is done, um, uh, yeah, the only other agenda items, it's done. We, we, we should talk about next time the next metrics we're going to start developing, but we have chaos con between now and then, so yeah. the risk part okay. of the is now concluded. Okay, I'll, I'm going to stop recording then. Okay. I got some stuff to add before we're done with risk. Oh. Um, I just wanted to mention I have a link here. This is the most most updated. It's the dev branch of the Augur DoSox 2 iteration in case anybody doesn't have that. And um, uh, that's an important follow up from last time because <laughs> now it is a, not a fork. It's a straight up repository inside the court, the chaos organization, which was one of the things that we wanted to be sure to do before release. Yeah, that's, good. that's good. I've got the beginnings of um, uh, what you're talking about, setting up infrastructure and being able to scan mass amounts and like print mass amounts. I've got the beginnings of that infrastructure under scanner tools. I can go do a link to that too, but um, it's got a bunch of the like beginnings of something that would be large infrastructure. Okay, fantastic. Sounds good. I stopped sharing. I think we're done with the risk portion of the call now. That's all for risk. Okay.